What is the most hideous thing in the universe? The answer is a naked human heart, all polluted with pride and selfishness and envy and greed and sloth and a thousand other forms of moral filth, making the human heart so hideous that only God, only he in all the universe, sees it as it is. So my great need is to be changed. But how can I be changed? The book of books tells me. It says by beholding, we can become changed. And the recurring admonition of the New Testament is to look unto Christ. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth was the Old Testament statement. But when we come to the New Testament, it says, consider him. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. You'll remember at the time of the Transfiguration when Christ was irradiated with glory and the disciples wanted to build tabernacles. The story ends by them saying, we see no man but Jesus only. If it's true that I need changing, and it is so true, and if it's true that by beholding we become changed, there's obviously only one way to be changed looking unto Jesus, considering him. You remember on one occasion our Lord went to Nazareth and they gave him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah and he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to open the prison house to them that are bound. And then it says, when he closed the book and sat down, the eyes of all in the synagogue were fastened on him. My friends, that's a clue, that's a key. When we read the Bible, we must, when we've closed the book, have our vision fixed on Jesus, seeing no man but Jesus only. Years ago, there was a great painting. It showed houses and lands and roads and cattle and people walking. And as you gaze at the painting, suddenly the items of the painting would fuse together into a picture of a face. That's what the Bible is like. The Bible seems to tell us about nations and historical events, laws, ritual, prophecies, but it's all about Jesus. You remember on the Emmaus Road, it says, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. That's, Matthew, that's Luke 24 and verse 27. And then in verse 45 it says, All these things were written in the law, in the prophets, and the Psalms concerning me. In the Old Testament of Psalm 40 it says, In the volume of the book it's written of me. Lo, I come. Luther said, What book? The Bible. What man? The Messiah. It's a book about Jesus. We are not reading it aright unless we find him there just as every dewdrop reflects the sun. So every passage of scripture reflects the sun of righteousness. It also tells us about ourselves. And so every time we read Holy Writ, we should find ourselves there and the failures, the sins, the follies of the human beings depicted and then find our cure, our remedy, our healing in the one altogether lovely, the cheapest of 10,000, the lily of the valley, the rose of Sharon. This study is known as typology. And like every good thing, it can be abused. In the days of Oregon, just a couple of centuries after Christ, all sorts of perversions were attached to Bible study. And typology did not escape. Many fanciful things were used on this basis, inaccurately. But today, scholars have come back more to a biblical base. And in a very famous book of this century, uh, Jesus in the Old Testament, the author R. France has pointed out that typology has come back into exegetical fashion and that today it's a very, very respectable and esteemed study among Bible scholars. Of course, you can't be dogmatic about typology unless you have a New Testament comment that says it is so, but there are more there than you would think. For example, take the Gospel of John. 
In John 1 and verse 51, Jesus is talking to Nathanael. He says, Believest thou? You'll see greater things than these. Hereafter you'll see heaven opened, and angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Here our Lord is referring to Jacob's dream. The exile, the outcast from home, fallen asleep, and in his mind's vision, he sees a wonderful, glorious ladder connecting heaven and earth with angels coming down, going up. Jesus says, that's a picture of me. I'm the ladder that connects heaven and earth. I am the means by which blessings come down and prayers go up. I'm the link between God and sinful man. So Jesus himself, in the very first chapter of John's Gospel, directs us to typology when he says, I am Jacob's ladder. You come into chapter 2 and he's at the temple. And before his enemies he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. In other words, he's saying the temple's a figure of him, a type of him, and so it was. That wonderful temple with its emblems of showbread and lights and the altar of prayer, the veil partition before the Most Holy, the ark containing the law, the Shekinah glory that was once there, the cherubim, all of these things told heavenly truths about the coming Messiah. So in John chapter 2, Jesus can say, destroy this temple, meaning himself, and in three days I'll raise it up. When we come to John chapter 3, in the 14th verse, he says to an astonished Nicodemus, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. What an amazing connection. A banner staff, a cross, and a serpent. Not a little fluffy lamb, a serpent. And Christ is saying, I am going to be treated as the devil so that you can be treated as though you were me. What a statement. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so I must be lifted up that whoever believeth I have everlasting life. And that's the prelude to the most famous verse of Scripture found in chapter 1000 of Holy Writ, John 3. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So John 1, John 2, John 3 draw from the types of Scripture. And in John 4, our Lord declares himself to be a well of living water, a fountain springing up. In the Old Testament, in so many passages, spoke of the wells as symbols of the coming Messiah who'd satisfy the thirst of a sinful world. Ezekiel 47 had pictured the river of life coming out of the temple, gradually deepening until it became waters one could swim in. And Jesus draws from these figures and he says, that water represents me. That's me. And when we come to the fifth chapter of John, he's the resurrection and the life, that which had been foretold in the Old Testament in Daniel chapter 12. But you remember there was a time when the rods of the tribes were placed in the temple, left there in the darkness, and then finally, when they were taken out, one had come alive. Figure of the Christ who one day would be laid in the darkness of Joseph's new tomb but it would suddenly come alive on the third day. We move into John 6 and he says, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Moses didn't really give you the manna. My father gave the manna. And it's a figure of me. The manna was white, symbolic of Christ's purity. It was round, a type of his perfections. It was sweet. It was sustaining. It came down with the dew in the night as Jesus came down quietly to Bethlehem. Jesus says, I'm the living manna. When you move into chapter 7, he's the living water again, like John 4. If anyone thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And from within him shall flow rivers of living water. This spake he of the Spirit, which those who believed on him should receive. In the 8th chapter, he declares himself to be the light of the world. Please notice, he's drawing from the Exodus story. He says, I'm the manna. I'm the water that came from the rock and I'm the pillar of light, of glory, of fire. I am the light of the world. If any man follows me, he shall not walk in darkness. 
This is an allusion to the Israelite pilgrims following the pillar of fire. Jesus says, that pillar of fire, that's me. That's me. He repeats the statement in the ninth chapter of John, I'm the light of the world. In the tenth chapter, he's the good shepherd. Many of the great characters of the Old Testament were shepherds. Abel, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David. Every one of them was a figure of our Lord in some respect or other. I am the light of the world. And so we could go on. The Gospel of John recurringly goes back to the Old Testament to find pictures of Jesus. It's legitimate we should do so. I want to begin our study of typology by Genesis 1 and noticing some things that not everybody has seen. Genesis chapter 1. Think of the concepts that are found in this chapter. Let me list them for you. It begins with God, in the beginning God, holiness, perfection. Then it says the earth is without form and void and darkness is upon the face of it. There you have a figure of sin, corruption. The words without form and void are often translated confusion, ruin, vanity, emptiness. What a contrast. The particle connecting the first two verse, verses which in most translations is given as and, and the earth was without form, can be translated but. Then it would read like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, but the earth was without form and void and darkness. These are figures of evil. Matter of fact, the expression in the Hebrew here, without form and void, the Greek translation uses bottomless pit. So here's a symbol of sin. Symbol of perfection, verse 1. Symbol of sin, verse 2. The first part. And then it mentions the Spirit of God moving upon the face of the waters. And then it says, and God said, here's the word speaking. And then there's separation between light and darkness. And the theme of separation is found throughout the chapter. The waters above the heavens and the waters below. Separation, separation. And on the third day, the earth comes up out of the waters. Figure of resurrection. And then you have a fecundity of life. Vegetation first. Life everywhere after the resurrection of the earth. And then the sun and the moon and the stars are focused upon. Next we see the waters teeming. We see the skies filled with birds. And finally a man in the image of God entering into Sabbath rest. Can I summarize for you these themes? Here they are. Holiness, sin, the Holy Spirit, the word preached, light, separation, resurrection, fruitfulness, shining lights, the image of God, and Sabbath rest. You know, that's the whole plan of salvation. We all begin a chaos. We enter this life without form and void spiritually. And darkness is on our hearts and on our minds. That's how I began. That's how you began. But thank God the Spirit of God has moved on us. And we've heard the Word of God proclaim light and truth. And immediately we began to make a separation between good and evil, between light and darkness, between the things of God and the things of the devil. And as we did that, we rose in resurrection life. And our life became fruitful. And by the grace of God, we become as shining lights to the world. And as the Spirit continues to move, and the Word continues to speak, we come back into the image of God. And then we enter into Sabbath rest. Have you noticed that in Genesis 1, each day has an evening and a morning? Until the seventh. There's no evening and morning mentioned in connection with the seventh day because it's a symbol of eternity. My friends, you see what we have found in Genesis 1? It's the whole history of the world encapsulated. The individual history of the believer, the history of the whole globe. We have God's original creation, the coming of sin, the moving of his spirit to bring men to repentance, the giving of the word, the coming of the living word, his resurrection on the third day. Notice it was on the third day that the earth came up out of the waters and then the fruitfulness that follows, making his church into a light that shines as from a great hill working on us till we become more and more like him. And in harmony with him, we enter into the peace of heaven, the Sabbath rest of eternity. 
It's interesting to notice that whenever the New Testament quotes Genesis 1, it uses it this way. For example, John's Gospel begins, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Here's a Gospel telling us about redemption and it begins the same way as Genesis. It mentions the beginning, it mentions God, and it mentions the Word, and then it goes on to talk about light. Then it talks about darkness. John chapter 1 replays all the main themes of Genesis 1, but it's talking about a new creation, it's talking about redemption. Paul can talk about the God who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. Peter used a similar figure in the second chapter of his first epistle. God has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of Jesus Christ. Then you go on to talk about the written word, prophecy, being a light in a dark place. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. So over and over again, the New Testament draws from Genesis 1 to tell us about redemption, salvation, coming out of the chaos of our souls, receiving the word of truth, walking in the light as the Spirit moves on us, becoming fruitful, coming light bearers, coming back to reflect Jesus and then experiencing rest. You remember in the great invitation, Jesus said, come and learn of me. Come unto me all ye that labour and I will give you rest. Come learn of me and you'll find rest. Here are two rests. One rest we have as soon as we come, justification. One rest that becomes progressively ours as we learn of him and become more and more like him. That's sanctification. That's why the great invitation has these two rests. Come unto me, you'll find rest. The moment you come, you have forgiveness of sins. Rest is yours. That's an imputed righteousness. You've still got much to change. As we learn of Jesus, we change and we find another rest, the rest of holiness and life in word and thought and deed. So there is much more in the first chapter of the Bible than most people have ever anticipated. It tells us all the main things we need to know about our lives, about redemption, and even about history. And if you want to know what the future has, this chapter tells us. When the earth has become terribly dark again, as it was in the days of the first advent, when darkness covered the earth and gross darkness the people, when this world becomes black again in moral indignities and hatred of God, when the world is filled once more from end to end with strife and nature is testifying with earthquakes and famines and pestilences, that'll be a time when the Spirit of God will move and we will see Pentecost take place all over the world for those people that have loved the Word of God. Then God's light will shine on the world. There'll be a division made between those who want to follow Scripture and those that don't. There'll be a resurrection among the churches to a faithful remnant in every denomination who loves Christ will follow the everlasting gospel. And when that happens, my friends, we'll be near the end. As the world sees the light, the church, a city set on a hill, radiating out the gospel, instead of struggling among themselves, instead of denominational squabbling, just telling about the glories of Christ, when that happens, people come back in the image of Jesus and then we'll hit eternity. So what we have in Genesis 1 is a forecast of all world history and a forecast of the end of history. I want you to think on Genesis 2. In Genesis 2 we have the story of the creation of our first representative from whom we all draw life, Adam, Adam the first. And we see him asleep on the sixth day. And God is the physician and the anaesthetist. God puts him to sleep, he opens his side, and from what is drawn from his side, he makes his bride. Now come with me over the millenniums. Come to another sixth day and to another Adam, also naked. And his side is opened on the cross. And from it come blood and water, symbolic of what will make the bride of Christ. From heaven he came and sought her to be his holy bride. I've likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and a delicate woman. Revelation 12 pictures the church as a beautiful bride, clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet, upon her head a glorious crown of twelve stars. 
on the sixth day of redemption week as the sixth day of creation week the second Adam fell asleep and his side was opened and what came therefrom made his bride now think with me on the third chapter we know the terrible story of rebellion and the story of the fall but let me read to you from this chapter 3 and I want you to notice that all the things that are mentioned in the punishment for sin reoccur at Calvary God says to the serpent because you've done this cursed and then he says I'll put enmity between you and the woman he'll bruise your head you'll bruise his heel and then to the woman he said I'll greatly multiply your pain in pain you'll bring forth children and then it used the word cursed again cursed is the ground because of you thorns and thistles it'll bring forth in the sweat of your brow you'll eat bread and then we read about the sword that kept the way of the tree of life my friend at Calvary Christ has made a curse for us he has a crown of thorns he experiences separation from God a sword a spear is thrust into his side all the things that belong to the curse the nakedness the sweat a little while earlier he'd been sweating Gethsemane the thorns and the sword the separation and finally death the seven marks of the curse pronounced in Eden when God said dust thou art and under dust thou shalt return those seven marks of the curse are all found at Calvary when we turn the page and come to Genesis 4 we read of the first good shepherd of the Bible but how short lived his life Abel means breath well, what is your life it's only a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away how does Abel die is it a suicide is it an accident is it a wandering Bedouin who does it if there'd been such people no the first good shepherd who dies young is murdered by his brother and my friends whenever you have a type of Christ given any space of significance in scripture lengthy detailed treatment if the family is mentioned the brothers are always opposed to the Christ figure and so you find that Jacob's brother Esau wants to kill him you'll find that Joseph's brothers despise him and sell him for pieces of silver David's brothers accuse him of coming down to see the battle when he'd come to bring them a gift whenever the brothers of the Christ figure are mentioned they are there to kill and to slay and so my friends we've introduced the first chapters of scripture and we see a depth there and a height and a length and a breadth when interpreted by the New Testament we find our Lord there because my greatest need is to be changed and it's by beholding we become changed looking under Jesus the author and finisher of our faith consider him who endured the contradiction of sinners against himself remember the words of Matthew's gospel about the Mount of Transfiguration they saw no man but Jesus only you and I'll have constant hurts in this world if we're influenced by anyone other than Jesus but if we look only to Jesus he will change us he'll make us into his own likeness we'll enter into that rest that was symbolized by the Sabbath we'll be ready for eternity so what have we said we said that Jesus is the Alpha and Omega of this book that he's the Alpha and Omega of redemption that he's the Alpha and Omega of our lives if we'll do what the angels do give him first place worship him adore him obey him heaven is ours not because of our obedience but because of what he has done and we've responded with all our hearts. God bless you.